AM560, The Answer, online at 560theanswer.com, on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. Only the biggest stories, only the biggest guests, and only the biggest opinions. This is AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy, as we've uh, talked about intermittently over the last nearly two years, this catastrophe in K-12 education, particularly in government school systems, if there's a silver lining, is that it's been a boon to competition at the K-12 through level, oh, both yeah. with respect to private schools, with respect to homeschooling, with respect to schooling cooperatives that families have set up in particular neighborhoods. And uh, frankly, I don't think in some places like Chicago and the Archdiocese in particular, the school choice proponents have been aggressive enough to take advantage of all of the disaffected parents who not only want their kids to, to be in a school that's open, are now seeing that they really need their kid to be in a school that's open and is about the business of educating kids. Because the Chicago Public Schools that were open for uh, generations before COVID-19 and they weren't really in the business of educating kids, as some parents have recently found out. Well, there is a, a new initiative that's being launched by a couple of uh, communications professionals with the American Federation for Children. Walter Blanks is one of them. He's the National Press Secretary for AFC. Nathan Kunin is the other one. He's a communications associate there. And their initiative is called the School Choice Boys with a Z. Uh, with the emphasis on creating content to bring more people into the school choice movement. And they join us now. Walter, Nathan, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. We're happy to be here. All right, boys, uh, tell us uh, about this new initiative. Yeah, well, first off, a uh, huge, huge thank you for acknowledging the boys with a Z. Yes, uh, yes. We always you guys get... are so current. <laughs> yeah, we always get so, super yeah. excited about that. But the purpose of the School Choice Boys, Nathan and I, realize that when you're talking about things that are super important to people across the country, uh, unfortunately, education doesn't really fall within the top 10 of those topics. And so looking at the current landscape of education and the importance of education, primarily school choice, we decided to bring our fun, unique personalities to the movement, both as beneficiaries of school choice. Uh, I'm from Ohio and Nathan is from Florida. We just think it's important to, to inform the, the next generation um, about what school choice is and the power that it has. Okay, so how do you do that? Especially for parents right now who have kids in public schools and they're failing their kids, how do we do this? Sure, so we see education as a root issue. Um, and one of the key tenets of the School Choice Boys is in keeping advocacy fun and keeping it light, we really wanna reframe these conversations to bring attention to why education is so important so that we can address issues just like that. Um, you see organized rallies for all sorts of political issues in this country, but consistently education seems to fall outside of the main focus of the general American public. So what School Choice Boys is seeking to do is to use our unique, and I tend to think we're pretty funny, uh, <laughs> our personalities to bring more attention to the movement so that we can con continue to pass legislation that assists parents and families that are stuck in situations that they might not necessarily want to be in. It seems like part of the challenge, though, too, is uh, the awareness of what opportunities exist currently, even in addition to what opportunities should be uh, advocated for uh, prospectively. So, for example, in Illinois with the tax credit scholarship program, you know, there's this opportunity uh, currently always under siege, of course, from the teachers unions and their minions in the General Assembly. But this opportunity to raise $100 million a year under the tax credit scholarship program and distribute that $100 million a year over the next several years to uh, children to go to the schools of their choosing, their families choosing. But um, one, there's you know the need to continue to build awareness in the donor community to, to make sure you're getting to the max so you have all the resources that are afforded by law to distribute in scholarship form. And two is to make sure that parents that are looking for alternatives know programs like this tax credit scholarship program in Illinois exist. Absolutely. And, and that's really you know another core feature of what we're trying to do with this new initiative is if you're a busy parent working 
working hard for your family, then you're worried about food on the table and you're worried about your kids coming home and getting their homework done. You're not necessarily spending tons of time seeking out alternative education options. So one of the things that we're passionate about is bringing that information to people where they are so that they can take advantage of things like the Illinois tax credit program. And with respect to the, the, the school choice programs that exist now, um, have they been able, in your estimation, to accommodate the increased demand over the last year and a half we, as we see families fleeing the government school systems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, across, I mean, just this past year, like you mentioned, coming out of the, the pandemic, we've seen uh, roughly 20 states um, either introduce new, new forms of legislation supporting school choice or expanding um, existing programs. And so across the board, uh, we're seeing parents and families uh, really stepping up to the plate and, and doing what's best for their, their children. And, and to point on what Nathan said earlier, coming um, out, of, out of the pandemic, a lot of parents, their eyes were really open to not only what was going on in, in their child's school, but the quality of education. And so a lot of parents stepped up. Uh, we saw pandemic pods uh, jump up across the country. And you just this sense of ownership and, and responsibility um, on parents and to really be in the driver's seat of, of their child's education. And when you talk about school choice, um, that's what it is at its, at its fundamental root. It seems, too, where so much emphasis has been placed from a policy perspective and rhetorically, which is kids that are in terrible schools. You know, this is uh, not so interesting to uh, people in wealthy suburban districts that are happy with their government school system and um, or have options and they have the resources to exercise those options. We, we've really emphasized over the last couple few decades major urban school districts or mid-sized urban school districts that have the same poor schools. And so there, it seems to me there's still this dearth of indigenous leadership from those neighborhoods and communities to be advocates for the programs that exist for their neighbors and friends. And I wonder how you reach, I mean, we talked to a, a young guy who's uh, running to replace Bobby Rush in the uh, first congressional district in Chicago um, or earlier in the show named Chris Butler, who's a pastor and he's active in the community. And he's a proponent of school choice, even though he's a, a Democrat. Seems like we need to identify more of those Chris Butlers out there in major urban centers and mid-sized urban centers with terrible school districts and have them be the faces and voices uh, educating and leading. Absolutely. And we feel very strongly that school choice is potentially one of the few political issues that can actually be truly bipartisan. Uh, we do see a lot of Democrats that support school choice, often uh, breaking with other members in their party. Um, and the reason for that is you talk about options and you talk about how do you reach people and continue to promote this message. And really the best advertisement that we can get for the school choice movement is exactly what's going on here in Chicago today. Uh, things like this union strike, which unilaterally shut down schools for over 300,000 kids and virtually leave low-income families with no other options other than to simply go home and wait, uh, is exactly why we need school choice. And I think that's really what pushes uh, a lot of up-and-coming politicians and politicians that have been around for a while to support school choice. Well, then what can those families do? I got a text message saying, this sounds great. What do I do? That's, I really wish that I had good news for you. Um, ultimately, governments need to, set up, need to step up and provide uh, education options to students. Chicago public schools receive $27,000 per student per year. Oh, yeah. And all of that money is continuing to flow into the school system, but the students aren't there. Uh, one of the reasons that we fight for school choice is because families need the access to use that money in a way that actually benefits them. Uh, there's a, a big case that the Supreme Court has taken up out of uh, the state of Maine with respect to tuition assistance programs, school choice. And uh, this is, uh, again, a, a challenge to these uh, uh, discriminatory Blaine amendments that still exist in many states. Uh, how important is this case before the high court on Maine? What would it mean for uh, the movement and for the availability of scholarships around the country if the Supreme Court were to rule consistent with the Zellman decision in favor of these school choice programs, the school choice program there. Yeah, it would be it would be absolutely um, huge um, as as usual and in, in setting precedent when you're talking about the, the Supreme Court and, and you bring up uh, Zellman. 
Uh, I was a huge, a huge fan of that being from Ohio and spent a lot of time at the, uh, at the Capitol and, and, and advocating. Um, but the, the most important thing is the, the Supreme Court would be allowing parents and families to have the options and empowering them to have those options and, and to act on those options. And even, even um, before, before the main uh, Supreme Court case, there was also um, one in Montana um, right. for similar things um, concerning the Blaine Amendment. And so all of it, every single issue, every single policy, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it's to ensure that parents and families have, have those options. If you're in a school and you love it, that's great. That's awesome. But if you're that parent that Nathan alluded to, like my mom, who worked two jobs just to uh, keep food on the table, right? There has to be other options than just the the school that that you're zoned to by your zip code. Well, the the other thing too, since you both mentioned at the outset, you're the beneficiaries of school choice, and what uh, I really like about the American Federation for Children, among other things, is the storytelling. You know, telling stories of actual kids that that benefited, what it meant for them, what it meant for their families, how they were able to pay it forward. Uh, you know, uh, p- producing uh, art, you know, to, to tell stories like the movie Miss Virginia, uh, Waiting for Superman, which is now 15 years old. Wow. Uh, it seems to me like that's that's something that we're, we're not very good at. You guys at American Federation for Children are much better at it than the median in sort of the movement. But the, the stories about hu- the, the human success stories just need to be told over and over and over again. Yeah, and that's really... A fundamental, uh, a fundamental component of what we do at the American Federation for Children, but also School Choice Boys, is the fact that we're direct beneficiaries of School Choice gives us this crazy superpower where whenever we're encountered with somebody who says, oh no, students shouldn't have options, or School Choice doesn't work, or this isn't actually what's best for kids, we have the ability to kind of look them in the eye and say, all right, what part of my life was wrong then? Um, and I've, I haven't met anybody yet that has had a response to that. Well, and the other thing that I think needs to be continually responded to is, and it's never stated overtly because it sounds so racist, because it is, uh, the, the idea that well, those people, they can't make these choices. You know, the, you, you give them resources, they won't make the right choice. That's why we have the experts in the public school systems. Uh, that needs to be addressed straight away, too, the idea that, um, minority families can't access the tax credit scholarship program in Chicago or Illinois and uh, see their way through to provide a, a better education for their children if they were granted the resources which are available. I, I think the, the, the pounding on that and the, really the premise of the argument being made by the teachers unions and and the other opponents of school choice is important. Yeah, and especially when you're talking about the the public education experts. And once again, not to not to paint teachers in a bad light because they are absolutely important and vital in education across across the board. But when you're looking at at parents, minority parents, uh, low income parents, and don't think that they can you know make the right decision and and they should be trusted, you know, are is the expectation that we should trust the same system where uh, less than fifteen percent of eighth grade black students are proficient in reading, right? Is that the system that we're supposed to supposed to trust? And I mean, I think about my own family, like I said, coming from a, a low performing school, a, a low income community, um, I didn't have any way out. And, and I always say without school choice, I'd either be in prison, um, six feet under, or in the same neighborhood that I, that I grew up in. And I've been to Europe, I've been to the White House multiple times, and, hmm. and now I truly get to inspire uh, the next generation of, of our country. Like what better life um, is there to tell? What better story is there to tell when you're talking about school choice and the outcomes that, that it actually produces? Uh, they are Walter Blanks, National Press Secretary for American Federation for Children, and Nathan Kunin, uh, Kunin who is the Communications Associate for AFC as well. Uh, federationforchildren.org is the website if you want to get more information on their new initiative called the School Choice Boys uh, with a Z. Uh, and uh, is there any other places uh, there would be podcasts and th- those sorts of things as well that people should uh, investigate? Podcasts is in the works, but please follow us at School Choice Boys on all platforms. With a Z. With a Z. Well, School we got Choice the Z. Boys <laughs> on, all, on all platforms. All right, boys, thanks so much for joining us, and good luck with the new initiative. Thank you. Thank There's you, only indeed. one radio show in Chicago talking about today's biggest stories and telling you what they really mean. That show is this one. Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer.
A while back, we at AmericanEagle.com were asked to build the e-commerce site of a major candy distributor. With the need for a website that could take into account everything from shipping times to local weather, because, you know, candy melts, the task was not like taking candy from a baby. Fortunately, we live for a good digital challenge and free bonbons. So we got to work on a slew of complex integrations, including a shipping algorithm that factored in variables like distance, speed, and location. The website even let the end customer personalize their candy for special events, like weddings or, you know, major website launches. 